So this is Nursing 622, Module 1, uh, Review of Gender Spectrum and Development and the LGBTQI. The objectives is upon completion of the module that you will be able to identify the normal patterns of physical and cognitive development, examine the gender spectrum, prioritize screenings and treatments that may lead to better outcomes across the lifespan. So when we look at self-perception, this is in chapter 18 uh, of your book. This begins at birth. This evolves throughout the lifespan. It's an indicator and predictor of mental health because how we perceive ourselves is going to directly correlate with our own mental health. How we think of ourselves, how we think of different abilities or skill sets that we're going to be able to do, how we view our own bodies. This is a critical indicator of quality of life from all different aspects as you travel throughout life. A positive perception has been shown to link to responsibility, commitment to goals, genuineness, positivity, a better outlook on different things. If you have a positive self-perception, you're going to be more likely to go and do more things, think you can achieve higher goals. And when you look at those standards of care, review the bright futures, how it integrates the self-concept with the overall health supervision throughout the lifespan, how depression and suicide potential complications of a negative self-perception. So we talk about the positive where you have that feeling of responsibility and commitment that you can do more. And then on the opposite side with the negative self-perception, there's that higher incidence of depression and suicide and ultimately the opposite effect that maybe you're not worth it or that you can't do things. Healthy People 2020 looks at those disparities in health and that we do need to significantly decrease major depression and suicide in adolescents, especially with recent COVID events. We've seen quite an increase in incidence of depression and suicide in this age group. So what is self-perception? Self-perception is that cognitive, that ideal perceived self. And then you have your affective component of that. So when you look at cognitive, that is your thinking, your reasoning, your remembering, looking at your intellectual activity. When you're looking at affective, this is those feelings, those emotions, and how you perceive things based on your ideal self and then what is perceived. And then the behavioral traits, your assertiveness, your resilience, decisiveness, respectiveness, respectfulness. And oftentimes you're not gonna be able to draw out that self-perception, it's hidden. Is a child or an adolescent gonna come right out and tell you how they feel about a discrepancy or a negative self-perception? This may be inferred by different things that they're talking about. Say, I don't want to participate in sports. Well, I'm overweight and I can't do this and I wouldn't be any good anyways. So that self-perception is negative, but are they going to come right out and say it? So paying attention and watching your patient's mannerisms is very significant here, especially during your history taking. Three aspects of self-perception, like we talked about the cognitive affective behavioral, and then we bring those components in even further. That personal and subjective, the descriptive evaluation of how they feel, the key component, significance, am I loved? Do I feel like I belong here? Do I feel like there's someone who's going to support me and care for me? The worthiness. I like myself. I need to like myself first before I expect other people to like myself. Do I respect myself? Do I have a purpose? If I wasn't here, would anybody care? Would anybody miss me? You hear that very often times, especially with depression and suicide. Would anybody miss me? 
Confidence, I can do it. Do they have that support system? Do they have that feeling, that self-perception that, hey, I'm confident, I'm in control, I'm capable, and I know that someone else believes in me, so I know I'm competent. I have that little bit behind me giving me that self-perception saying, I'm competent to do this. External measures are often used when they don't feel significant, worthy, or competent. You look at that mindset with the growth mindset where the focus is just on learning, not with the performance, um, not with, okay, what is the immediate result that I'm going to absolutely get praised for this. Someone's going to tell me how good of a job I'm doing. This growth mindset, when you're looking at self-perception is, I know in the end it's going to be worth it. I might not get that praise right away, but I'm more concerned with learning than with my performance and getting that immediate praise for what I've done. Whereas the, the fixed mindset believes that success, everything is focused on the success due to that fixed trader talent. Not that, okay, my hard work is gonna get there. Usually they receive praise for the trade but their performance they feel is their self-worth. So if they don't perform well at one portion, then their self-worth decreases. So when we look at this box with the external measures you use uh, to build the self-perception, they're physical, intellectual, performance, importance, financial, control. These are all things that come into play with self-perception. Factors that influence it, those significant relationships, parents, siblings, <clears throat> family members, caretakers, other adults, anybody who is involved in their life that they look to as someone who is significant. Does it have to be a blood relative? No, it doesn't. This is whom that patient feels is someone important in their life. And we see this parent-child attachment. This is a role in development of the brain. You've seen children that have developmental dis delays that are secondary to, there is no interaction. <clears throat> there is no cognitive development or discussion because there isn't that human interaction. Stressors, trauma, this can also play a role in the development of the brain because we shut down, we clamp up. And kids' brains are growing so rapidly that this parent-child attachment is so significant. When we look at the health and chronic conditions with disabilities, um, you know, different appearances and self-perception, you know, we teach our children, don't stare. Everybody's different. You know, how is that going to affect their self-perception if you have people staring at you constantly? Or your physical activity, your diet, your weight, your lifestyle choices. You know, constantly wondering, oh, are they talking about me? Do they see what I see? That's my self-perception based on these factors because I'm not comfortable with it. I don't have that feeling of self-worth. Excess weight predicts low self-esteem. We've seen that with cultural identity, race, ethnicity, with the socialization, especially when there is just a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowledge of possible physical or medical complications and conditions that could be contributing to it. Social experiences, we see it a lot. It's a lot different in the age of social media. We didn't have this when I was younger, where you had all of this. If you were you know, in an argument or things were going on, yeah, you, it was at school or different get togethers. Now it's all over the place, all over social media, social experiences. We look at the models, the celebrities, and the comparison is there for self-esteem. Same thing with video games. Why? It's just that focus. It's, again, that not interaction. And if you have low self-esteem and you're on this video and there's nobody else around you, you can be who you want to be. Nobody is there judging you. It's just you. So red flags and risk factors constantly asking for reassurance, depression, suicide, negative comments about themselves, obsessive disorders, 
It's the only control that they can have if they have a low self-worth or self-perception. Physical factors, physical alterations, mental and emotion alterations, these can be congenital, these can be secondary to trauma, environmental relational alterations, low income families, those disparities of health. This is why this comes full circle and is so important. Goals, learn how to describe and help these children evaluate themselves. How to help them give a sense of self-worth. How to look for that input for that sense of self by reading the hidden cues. Observe behaviors, their statements. And there's multiple tools that you can look at that will help with assessing this self-perception. During the history and physical, looking at the relationship between child and parent or caregiver, words that are used, the tone of voice, when something is uncomfortable, how does that child react, who do they look to for that comfort, nonverbal physical interactions, any encouragement, guidance, those expectations when they say, hey, no, I know I got to get this done because my mom and dad are going to be really unhappy and disappointed in me. Is there that discipline? Is there that listening and interaction between or is it just friends or on the flip side, is there concern for possible neglect? These are all things that you're going to observe during your history and physical. Facilitating good parenting, again, you know yourself, know your child, value your child, tell them that you appreciate. Don't try to compare them ch child to child or to other people. Make sure you are available, you look at them, you're talking to them physically and emotionally, and be their biggest cheerleader. Even if they're not doing well, hey, I know that you tried your best. All right, I'm so proud of you for trying your best. Let them know that they have that backup. Take the time, don't hurry them through. Family meals are so important. This is when you talk, you regroup throughout, throughout the day. Maintain your expectations of the child. Clearly state those expectations, use discipline. We wanna teach them, yes, there's gonna be punishments, but also what is the positive as well? You should always end on a positive note. Communicate positively with them. Focus on them understanding what you're talking about so then they learn lifelong. Use I statements. Talk about, I feel that maybe we should X, Y, and Z, not you did this, you did that. What does that do? It decreases their self-perception and self-worth. <clears throat> Provide helpful strategies. And you can review, the, review this. Look at the seven C's, competence, Confidence, connection, character, contribution, coping, control. Foster those buildings of assets. Involve everyone in your child's life. Um, you know, look at the Search Institute. There's a lot of uh, good tips and information there about, you know, maintaining that self perception and help your child have a sense of purpose. When you're looking at complications, we look at self esteem. You can have that loss of confidence, that feeling of insecurity. Well, then what spirals out from that? You can have self-destructive behaviors where they also will be obsessed with one thing that they know they can control. They might be withdrawn, looking any way possible to people, please. When you look at differential diagnosis, you look at personal identity, which we're going to be talking about shortly. Body image problems, how do they feel? And when they don't feel that acceptance or belonging, then you have those complications of aggression, acting out, behavioral problems. That's why we say to teachers and counselors, well, why are they acting out in school? Is there something else going on that we don't know about? Depression, suicide, eating disorders, teen pregnancies, these all contribute. So when you look at the description of how you feel with self-perception. Do they feel hesitant? Have they failed at things before and they're nervous about that happening again? Do they feel incompetent? Um, 
you know, and again, looking at those somatic complaints, behavioral problems, school issues is very important. Is there guilt? Is there anger or hostility from any events that have been going on, family life, things at school, things in the community? Body image problems is huge. It's that perception of and the actual appearance of the body. It doesn't matter if I tell you exactly how I feel you appear. It's how you perceive it. And this is where we get into the eating disorders, the hiding parts of the body, feeling shame and embarrassment, feel of rejection. And again, allowing patients to be able to talk about this and talk about their perception, not you telling them, oh, but you're fine. This is your BMI. I don't know why you feel that way. But they perceive themselves that way. You can have someone who's anorexic and is 70 pounds and they perceive themselves as fat. You cannot then tell them you're not because of X, Y, and Z. You need to understand there's body image disturbances. So this brings into play the transgender patient. Gender identity is the sense of being male or female. For most, it's your physical genitalia at birth. And then we have the gender dysphoria, where that gender identity and natal sex, there is an incongruence there. And it does cause a lot of stress and you know, there's a lot of things that come into play, especially your terminology. How do you talk to these people? And there's going to be a lot of different things that they're going to run into, including if they end up making changes or how they're going to identify. The definition of gender dysphoria is the discomfort when the physical excess, physical sex or assigned gender isn't congruent with gender identity. It's very underestimated. It's more prevalent than is voiced because of the stigma attached to it. Remember that you need to know what they identify as. Use their preferred name, their preferred pronoun. look at terms related to gender identity we look at the sex the term applied at birth the alternative gender gender identity do they say male or female transgender individual whose gender is not necessarily correspond with the sex that they were born with trans woman is the biological male who has expressed gender as female and then trans woman is the opposite of female who expresses uh, their gender as a male, and then cisgender is whom they're biological. They were born female and they express gender as that. When we look at the etiology, it is looked at previously that transgender was a mental illness. Um, some biological theories show that the brain develops different than the time of the genitalia and it's binary. And we look at that current understanding with the diagnosis criteria that this is not a disorder and that gender dysmorphia can cause depression and anxiety. Criteria for starting hormones, you know, that persistent, well-documented gender dysphoria, capacity to make an informed decision, age of a majority in the given country, the medical or mental health. And then we look at that nurse practitioner role to facilitate that diagnosis of gender dysphoria and determining the healthcare needs of the clients. That is your job. And then you need to look at the healthcare, the support, the social transition through this, you know, assessment and treatment with possible hormone therapy, surgical alterations, and then again, you have the legal name and gender changes. Trans woman, we look at hormone therapy, that estrogen therapy um, that they would start. And then the health assessment is, you know, with breast examination, the risk for heart disease, stroke, osteoporosis, you know, those are still things that are going to need to be taken care of, okay? Because we're suppressing that testosterone production. However, if... <clears throat> You don't pay attention to family history and other things, depending on how far the transition is. You still need to make sure you're doing screening tools based off of the gender that they were born as. 
trans men, testosterone therapy, you suppress the estrogen, um, causes the voice to drop, increase muscle max. And again, if they still need to have pelvic exams, mammograms, and having to have that discussion with them and build that trust as their provider to know that, hey, we still have to do these things because it's for you, for your safety, and that's what's important. So get you thinking for you to review, you know, discuss and look at the health disparities that are there with these individuals. How do you speak to someone with diverse sexual orientation? What are the characteristics of the population? What are the mental health needs? What is gender dysphoria? Looking at bullying, gender identity, biological sex and sexual orientation and who they identify with. What do the following terms mean? Trans man, trans woman, cisgender. Looking at those gender affirming surgeries and what it entails as far as hormone therapy, complications and those types of things. And then your references for your textbook readings and additional resources.